This is Bill Ritz, yeah. Hello and welcome to this episode of Quality of Life. In this episode, we're going to talk about the science of robotic surgery. To help us discuss that topic, joining us from Aurora Healthcare is Dr. Bill Ritt, who's a general surgeon, Dr. Nick Drager, who's also a general surgeon, and Dr. Jeff Tomasini, who is from urology. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thank you Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Excellent. This, to me, this is an exciting <coughs> subject to talk about because formerly working in healthcare and in IT, and you talk about robotics and you know how it works, this is you know, really exciting as far as that goes. Uh, how long has the science of you know, robo robotic surgery or technology been around? It's been around for quite a, a long time, actually, in actual clinical practice for about 15 years or so. Um, the uh, centers that were using robotics at that time, very few and select, uh, and then it started to disseminate as the technology grew and more and more surgical disciplines started to use the technology. Okay. Is it meant, you know, has <clears throat> it been like used on, let's just say, in the veterinary arena at all, or has it mostly been on people? Not to my knowledge in the veterinary um, uh, field, but uh, certainly uh, it is increasing uh, across the board, uh, across multiple disciplines in, uh, in human surgery, of course. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, <clears throat> tell us about the new technology coming into your facilities here, Aurora and Sheboygan. The newest technology we have is the uh, DaVinci XI system, which is the pinnacle of their uh, technology right now. Um, it's the same machine you'll find anywhere from Harvard to, um, uh, to Mayo to Cleveland Clinic. So the, uh, the fact that we have that here is really great, really great for the patients. Um, it allows us access to all sorts of areas of the body that we might not have had such good access to before, um, along with all the other advances in terms of uh, better camera, different lighting techniques to see different uh, organs and, and such. Okay. Uh just to tail on it a little bit more, are there any other you know, benefits to this new technology that it brings to the table where we didn't have before? The, I would say the two or three of the biggest technology advances that we've had compared to the laparoscopic or open techniques are, one is visualization. Um, before we were doing everything, you know, even if we could do a minimal invasive, it would be laparoscopic, but it was on a 2D scale, so it was kind of like looking at a t TV screen instead of looking at a 3D, like we normally view things. Uh, the way we view things now through the robot is actually in three dimensions, um, and we've never had access to that before. So the dissection planes, the quality of what you can see, um, the minutia of what you can see is a lot better now um, with the robot as opposed to anything we had or had ever dreamed of before. The other thing that's the greatest um, advantage for us surgeons is the way the arms articulate. It's more like a wrist um, as opposed to laparoscopically, you could really only open and close. You could rotate and open and close that way, but you were limited. It was basically like having fixed arms, whereas now we're able to manipulate tissue almost like our hands are inside the abdomen without our hands being inside the abdomen. So would it be about invasively the same as like what you do now or would it be less invasive or just a different way of doing it? Um, technically, you know, any procedure that we do laparoscopically we could do with a robot. So um, as far as the incisions go, a lot of them are the same size as, as a laparoscopic. That being said, we can often do it with a lot less incisions, a lot smaller incisions, and it allows us to do a lot of procedures that we weren't able to do laparoscopically with a robot. So instead of somebody getting a big incision, and we're talking like 10, 15 centimeter incision, um, we're now able to do it with smaller incisions. Okay. Who will be able to use this technology? Is it pretty much limited to, like you say, yourselves at Aurora, or eventually if other physicians have you know, practice rights or privileges, will they be able to use it as well, or is it just specialized in the one thing right now? Well, right, right now, um, the surgeons using it are uh, general surgeons and myself in urology. Um, we do have a, general, uh, excuse me, a gynecologic surgeon who will be using it in the near future as well, and potentially even in ENT surgery uh, down the road. So we have as many as four disciplines across the board that could be using this technology to, um, to do surgery. Nice. Mm -hmm. Is there any type of training or certifications that you have to go through or special schooling to be able to use this technology or tool in your procedures? Well, first of all, there's the general pathway for the surgeon or urolo urologic surgeon, gynecologic surgeon to go through medical school, residency, um, and all their training programs to be able to do everything safely um, with any technique. And then there's additional training for the robot. Um, you have to be proctored on so many cases. You have to watch so many cases, um, be able to work the robot not only at the bedside but at the surgeon's side also, so you can troubleshoot anything that could be potentially um, an issue during surgery, which really doesn't happen, but you have to know the technology to be able to use it. So there's extra training, extra certifications that we've all um, gone through 
Um, there have been uh, animal labs that we go to and also uh, human cadaver labs before you're even able to operate on a person. Okay. And Dr. Red, Dr. Drager, and myself all had extensive training with uh, robotic surgery in our residency program, so we're very familiar and comfortable with the technology and had a lot of training at that point, so it translates nicely into our clinical practice now. And the greatest <coughs> thing about the robot itself is whereas a lot of our colleagues were trained during residency with all open technique, and then once they were out in the field, they had to learn laparoscopic techniques, which is completely different. Right. Um, we were trained open laparoscopic and with a robot, but that being said, the robot isn't a whole lot, it's not a different modality, it's not a different way of operating, it actually just makes the laparoscopic stuff a lot easier. So as far as the training process, mm -hmm. there is a, you know, an extensive training process that goes into it, but it actually is easier to do it from a surgical standpoint robotically than it is laparoscopically. Okay. Getting into the technology or the process a little bit now, um, is it basically when you're operating the robot, it's obviously all set up with everything. And is it you're running controls almost like a computer joystick game or whichever, or is it like a you know a machine out on the shop floor when you're making parts, so to speak, where you program the thing and it goes in and does the thing? I guess how does it work? You know, as far as that goes. So the the current there's only one um, FDA approved robotic platform right now, which is as Dr. Ritt uh, suggested. What we have is the Da Vinci Xi. Uh, it has three components to it, and one is called a surgeon's console, and that's where uh, whoever the surgeon is, is sitting to operate and uh, operate the instrumentation. There's a patient side console, or what we all refer to as the robot, and this is an instrument that has um, four different arms that uh, can approach and hold the instruments um, in traditional laparoscopic ports that are held into the, are placed into the abdomen. And then there's a, the third portion of it is a, we call it a vision tower, and it has all the um, devices that are necessary to help run the equipment. So the instrument, the robot, actually just literally holds the instruments at the bedside, and the surgeon sitting at the console has some hand controls and foot pedals that we can use to control cameras and energy delivery uh, and the various instruments and different arms of the robot in order to, uh, and that's translated uh, over to the patient side uh, mm -hmm. robot, and that's where the the uh, magic essentially happens. Okay. Do you see it eventually, like some of the sci-fi shows or some of the medical shows you see nowadays, you have the robot set up, ready to go on this patient, but you need a specialist for this one procedure that they could actually be doing this remotely from their office, so to speak? This actually has happened um, quite a long time ago, uh, remote surgeries, uh, and this is part of where uh, robotic surgery was born out of. Um, I believe it was uh, 2001 was the first time a transatlantic surgery was performed. It was a cholecystectomy or removing the gallbladder. The surgeon was in, um, I believe, in New York City, and the patient was in Paris. And the procedure went very well. And the idea being that uh, space travel, things like that, or even you know remote uh, areas, a surgeon can be in one place, the patient with the robot in another. Um, and ultimately, there is work being done on more autonomous type surgery, but that is very far in the future at this point. Nice. Part of my IT background, you know, we had talked a little bit, you know, pre on the show. Part of my IT background says, boy, you know, you have operating systems, cyber threats, updates, you know. I'm assuming, you know, they are working on that or whatever platform it's on because the last thing you need is... You know, the little window comes up. You need to reboot to apply updates during the middle of a surgery, so I'm sure lots of, you know, protection and precautions have been taken on that as well as not only, you know, like you said, if it's now a computer, it's on the network, it's also open to, you know, cyber threats. You know, as far as that goes, and viruses and everything like that as well. Well, our system it, it <coughs> operates me. on a closed system. I, I don't believe there's any security threat or any, any threat of hacking. Right. And in terms of um, you know breakdown of the actual machine, we've never experienced. That. I don't know if there's ever been one ex that, uh, that anybody knows of. Even um, the machine is very safe, very reliable, um, very consistent, which is uh, important. Obviously, when you're mm -hmm. operating on a person, there's nothing more important than that. So the uh, the consistency with which it performs is, is fantastic, yeah. and. Um, you know, occasionally there will be errors and the machine will alert you to an error, but it's uh, usually involved with the way an instrument is positioned or with, um, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. There's no uh, software errors that we've ever encountered. And as far as, you know, worst case scenarios, you know, like city blackouts and stuff like right. that, that's no different than if there's a city blackout now where if you're doing an open procedure and you have complete loss of power, 
the hospital is set up for loss of power and backup generators and right. stuff like that. So, you know, loss of power is obviously our biggest concern, you know, especially when you're working on a mm -hmm. robot. Um, but again, we have stuff in place where yeah. even if you have an open abdomen, it's no different. Mm -hmm. Right. Loss of power that way versus loss of power with a robot. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just another layer right. to plan for for contingencies now that the network is as you want. You know, if it's either server or whatever is here in one place, the robot here in the console is another, you need to make sure that the connections are right. always up and mm -hmm. that's always a you know, right. power generator as well, just for to provide, you know, assurance of the people at home that, mm -hmm. you know, these things are all being taken into account. And, and, and they definitely are. And, you, I mean, we could always convert to mm -hmm. a laparoscopic procedure from a robotic or even from the robotic to laparoscopic to open if we would have, you know, whatever was be safest for the patient, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's also a great point. You can always recover, you know, and still right. go back in because, as right. you mentioned earlier, you know, the procedures are the same. Right. It's just that the robot for you know, detailed, you know, really that fine where you're in critical areas yeah. or sensitive areas that, you know, you're talking hairline, mm -hmm. you know, procedures versus, you know, cutting or tape, removing a fingernail, so to speak, or right. a toenail is a little different. Right. So, and hopefully neither you guys have random, you know, glitches or whatever when you're... <laughs> well, and that's working. part of the benefit, you know, that's, benefit of the robot is it actually has tremor reduction built into it, uh, and so it does reduce that aspect of it too. Okay. Mm -hmm. As far as the patient's experience, do they, do you see them, is it being pretty much the same or the same amount of time being, you know, on an operating table under anesthesia? Do you see procedures, you know, being actually performed in a more quick, quick fashion so actually they're under anesthesia less time and better recovery times? That's where the new, the new platform, the XI, it's the, the newest robot and they've worked out a lot of those kinks. Um, people, you know, would, would go in for a surgery and it would take four hours to do maybe a, a half an hour surgery with the older versions. The new version makes everything so streamlined, so um, once you get the robot to the table, things are able to move along quickly, and the actual operations themselves really don't take any longer and sometimes take shorter with the, you know, aid of the wristed instruments and, and the increased visualization. So we don't see any delay um, in patient care. We don't see any extended anesthesia times at this point. Um, like you said, if anything, it's less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And in neurologic surgery, many of the procedures we're doing robotically these days were procedures that there was no intermediary, for the most part, laparoscopic version of that because they're more complex reconstruction or procedures deep in the pelvis that were just very difficult to do laparoscopically. So we really went from doing open surgery, uh, for, for instance, for prostatectomy or partial nephrectomy for kidney tumors, we went from open surgery to robotic surgery. And we kind of skipped, for the most part, the laparoscopic version of that because it was more challenging. Mm -hmm. And we've seen, as a result, it's about comparable times uh, in the operating room, but where the real benefit of the robot comes in is that improvement in the length of stay uh, after surgery in the hospital. And many patients after these procedures, instead of staying one, two, even four or five days after kidney surgery, are now leaving after 24 hours in the hospital. Nice, nice. Are there any risks? I mean, with technology and computers, once in a while you see latency. You know, if something mm -hmm. happens and the commands don't go through the network or something would get bogged down, you know, that's a general technology thing. So are there any risks that may happen or, you know, that may be prone to happening with the technology like this? The, really, the only difference between, at least for um, many of the urologic surgeries, is as I alluded to, we were doing these as open surgeries. Now, doing laparoscopic surgeries, we have to fill the abdomen with carbon dioxide gas in order to have a working space, and sure. um, that's also one of the benefits is it reduces blood loss through that mechanism. Uh, in some patients, if the heart and the lungs are not up to, uh, up to speed, if there's some problems with the heart and lungs, it can be a little bit more challenging, and positional things can also affect that. So that's really the biggest difference or the biggest risk with mm -hmm. this. And there's a lot of safeguards that the robot has employed so that the instruments, when they're advanced through the robotic system, uh, don't just get placed um, you know, haphazardly into the abdomen. They go back to the position they were at, and three millimeters shorter, actually, so that uh, if an instrument was close to a, a vital organ, uh, aorta, vena cava, something like that, it won't go through and cause a puncture injury. It actually stops just short of where it was previously. So that there's a lot of safeguards built into it to nice. prevent those. Nice. A lot of thought had to go into that. So whoever you know, designed <laughs> this, you know, these algorithms or whatever was either a genius or a mad scientist. One of the two. <laughs> little both, probably. Yeah. Probably a little bit of in, both. In regards to the risk, the actual, the robot, you know, helps us out a lot in terms of um, decreasing a lot of the risks, especially with infection. Because we're able to bring down, you know, larger incisions down to small incisions mm -hmm. about that size, less incision means less risk of infection. 
um, and that is obviously beneficial to the patient. Um, uh, decreased pain and decreased length of stay, all these things that we see from the robot are all you know, more risky with other surgeries than the actual robot, which is, which is one of the reasons we wanted to bring it here. Nice. I'd like to go a little bit into your backgrounds. You know, obviously medical school and everything, but you also have technology backgrounds, you know, or other types of backgrounds, you know, that you work in. Because, you know, obviously you guys are the new generation, so to speak, of physicians coming in. So I guess who do you see really adopting and really taking off and really running with this type of technology? It's um, in many disciplines, general surgery, urology, OBGYN, um, a number of disciplines now, this is how residents are training um, is very strongly with robotic instrumentation. And so um, most uh, of uh, the doctors that are graduating from residency programs these days in these surgical fields are being trained on robotic uh, surgery. It's nice. essentially the new version of laparoscopy and this is becoming the newer standard. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what I was going to say too, Jeff. It's, yeah. like it's becoming the standard of care. Um, it's not quite there for general surgery, but it, it will be <coughs> for a lot of procedures as the studies come out. And as the follow-up, you know, uh, goes on, stretches out five years, ten years, um, I believe it will be the standard care for certain procedures. I believe it already is for prostatectomies from a urology standpoint. Um, OBGYN, a lot of them, um, it's becoming the standard for them as well. I know it's going to be weird as, you know, all of a sudden walking through a park and I see you sitting there with your iPad or your Android tablet. What are you doing? Oh, I'm just doing a surgery right now. <laughs> Something like that. You know, you know, that's probably the way future. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, we're, we're a few years out from that, yeah. But, but the technology, I mean, we're all younger surgeons yeah. um, and we've been trained on this from, from the get-go. But the real um, truth of the matter is that it's a, it's a technology that's been able, in, uh, able to work and embraced by surgeons of all ages. And um, where we trained even some of the older surgeons who are a little more resistant to change, um, they would try the robot and they would like it and they would see their patients were happier with the outcome. And so these, patients, these surgeons who are typically set in their ways and they do things how they've been doing them for 20 years will change because they've seen the outcomes and, and, and they prove. I mean, there were some that even took the step the drastic step from just doing all, all open procedures, never adapting the laparoscopic procedures and going straight to robot because they saw the advantage of it. Um, it's kind of like from a urology standpoint, there you guys didn't really get into the whole laparoscopic stuff just because the utility wasn't there. Yeah, well, but, the t utility was there. It was just really challenging. Right. And so it took a lot of skill to do those, and, uh, and it was just more challenging to do the reconstruction. So, so. to see the older yeah. surgeons that, you know, put aside laparoscopic mm -hmm. technique and said we don't need this to say to embrace the robotic technology is pretty it's pretty amazing mm -hmm. you know I'd also think just my thought here is it would also give people who want to be surgeons you know they have the how should I say the knowledge you know they know the anatomy they know everything but they may have a little bit of a physical thing where now this may give them chance to be actual operating surgeons because it's more technology which is you know, very precise, stable, centered, where they can control it versus, you know, now it takes away some of the risk factor of, oops, you missed and cut this or cut that, you know, where you manually do it with your hands. Yeah, we still do a lot of work with our hands, um, uh, and definitely getting the patient to the OR table is mm -hmm. one of the biggest things, you know, the, the history and physical and the workup, it's all a very hands-on thing. Sure. But um, the, the technology is, is quite exciting and it's kind of fun. <laughs> How about procedure prep time? Still about the same. You know, you still have to bring them in, get them prepped, put them under, and get them all ready for that. It's still pretty much the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Essentially. And uh, one of the wonderful things I think really what's making us so successful at uh, Memorial Hospital is that uh, we have an amazing surgical team. Uh, robotics is not just about the surgeon. We're just a very small part of this team. Right. And we have a very dedicated and uh, hands-on team at uh, Memorial Hospital that has really made this successful. We've launched this program and we've done quite a number of surgeries already. Um, we're doing very well with it and it's much to do with our team. Uh, their dedication is uh, unmatched. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's something <clears throat> when I worked in healthcare, you know, it's the same type of a thing, even though I was in IT, you know, I still felt part of the team where I'm contributing to make this happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I was the technology mm -hmm. person to make mm -hmm. sure everything was rock solid, secure, mm -hmm. you know, ready to go. So. I understand, you know, the whole teamwork thing is it takes everybody, you know, to make a service successful as far as that goes. Definitely. 
Yeah, and that's what we're lucky, like, like Jeff said, to have here in Sheboygan is the team effort from everybody from people that are cleaning the rooms afterwards to mm -hmm. the nurses that are handing us the instruments to the people that are down in CPD cleaning the instruments. Everybody works very hard, makes things very efficient. Yeah. And we've had people come in and watch our surgeries, um, watch the first few robotic surgeries, make sure things are going well and going efficiently. And they're blown out of the water by how well things go and how efficient it is for a program that's only been up for a couple of weeks where yeah. these guys have been operating for years. Right. And they're going back to their places <laughs> and saying, you know, we, we got to be like Sheboygan, we got to go faster, yeah. we got to be better. Yeah. So that's a nice feeling to have already a couple of weeks into the program. And I would imagine you could use, provided HIPAA and disclosure and everything, you, I would think you could use you know, some of the surgeries that you do as training activities for other surgeons coming in, because I'm sure you can record mm -hmm. you know, the procedures as well and use them as training activities you know, for other people to see and observe you know, who want to be physicians or in their training as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The actual machine has a bunch of, um, there's a training pack on it that's, that we attach to it, and there's all sorts of training um, maneuvers and things you go through in surgeries that um, are basically like a video game you know, with consequences. You know, you hit this and it starts bleeding, then you have to deal with it. Right. Um, so that training pack comes with it, and that's part of the learning process and things that training we've gone through already. So. So between procedures, it doesn't come up with you want to install a mobile strike or something like that. No, <laughs> nothing like that. <laughs> nothing like that. all the time. No, no Adobe updates. No. Nice, <laughs> nice. Um, how is this uh, new wave of technology on procedures being, you know, accepted in the general community? I mean, you know, are health care costs going to go down? Does this help reduce? And you know, and how in, how are insurance companies reacting to it? Overall, I mean. Costs are going to go down. You know, uh, you look at the price tag on it, and it's easy to see, see or think that the costs are going to go, they're going to skyrocket. But when you look at length of stay, which is always one of the biggest ones mm -hmm. for us from a general surgery standpoint and urology standpoint, um, mm -hmm. length of stay is a big cost as far as length of OR time, and as far as one of the bigger one is return to work and how fast can we right. get people back to work and back, you know, enjoying their activities of daily life, and all those will go down um, as we use the robot more. As far as the cost of the patient itself, there is no difference as far as how we bill it, you know, from a laparoscopic cholecystectomy mm -hmm. to a robotic cholecystectomy, the, the cost to the patient is exactly the same. It, it won't change. Um, sometimes people can get into some issues with their insurance if it gets boarded a certain way um, as far as them saying it's not the standard of care or the standard of care. Um, but from a billing standpoint, it's, it's exactly the same. There's no difference in cost to the actual patient as far as what's coming out of the pocket. Provided it's coded correctly right. you know and that's part of the team as well and from our you standpoint know. there is no difference in coding right now there I mean down the road there may be um, there may be a difference but as far as the CPT coding you know our reimbursement isn't any different or our pay or coding is exactly the same okay and just like uh, Dr. Drager was saying that it is an expensive instrument and so it's easy to think that this is going to cost the patient more but ultimately where the recovery of cost comes in with robotic surgery is not necessarily in that setting but when compared to at least traditionally in some of the robotic, or excuse me, laparoscopic uh, urologic surgeries, some of the instruments we use were one-time disposable instruments that were very costly, mm -hmm. and a lot of the instruments for robotics are reusable to a degree, uh, and they're cheaper because of that. Uh, and then looking at length of stay and a lot of the other factors that go into this, patients are leaving the hospital sooner, and that's where that recovery of cost comes in. And so ultimately, in many studies, uh, looking at robotic versus laparoscopic nephrectomy, removing the entire kidney, they essentially break even on cost, and this is now a safer procedure, and we can do more complex procedures sure. because of it. Sure, complex or it, you know, shrinks the you know length of stay down, like you were saying before, mm -hmm. or would this ever be used in like one day type surgery? Does it have applications? Yeah. I guess mm -hmm. that the, probably the applications are unlimited. It's just a matter of what do you want to do next and come up with your plan as far as how to. Progress with it. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. some of the cases we do are outpatient procedures from a general surgery standpoint. Like I said before, anything you can do laparoscopically, you can do with a robot. And so I know uh, Dr. Ritt has already done some hernias and, mm -hmm. and some different stuff where people come in that morning and go home in the afternoon. I mean, granted, a lot of them do that. We do that with laparoscopic stuff now, but um, the capabilities are pretty much endless, like you said. Yeah. Um, I know we've been talking quite a bit about this, but, you know, just kind of pick your brains as far as what's on the scope for future technologies that you guys will be bringing in, you know, for into the discipline? Well, right now, one of the pitfalls you might say about robotic surgery is it's all by wire. So we don't actually, for instance, in traditional laparoscopic surgery, you're at the bedside with the patient. And when you grasp tissue, you can actually feel that through the mm -hmm. instrument. When you're tying a suture, you can feel the tension on the knot. And that is lost with robotic surgery. Right. It's all by wire. So 
you, you have to rely on visual cues, uh, how the, the tissues deform to know how tight a suture is being tied. Uh, and from what I understand, that some of the technologies coming down the road with newer t uh, robotic platforms involve haptic technology. So being able to feel this tension, this uh, the pressure, how much pressure is being applied to mm -hmm. tissues and suture material and those types of things. So uh, the current um, instrumentation also has um, uh, different cameras inside of it. So uh, it allows for uh, visualization through fluorescence. So. Um, I know Dr. Ritt and I have both been using, um, it's called ICG, it's an, an, a dye that's administered intravenously and this can highlight vascular structures and show us if something is getting good blood supply or not sure. and uh, useful in uh, gallbladder removal and a variety of things and it's all through fluorescence. So there's really interesting technologies that are even baked into the new, to this current iteration of the, the platform. Nice. Mm -hmm. Anything? that you guys can add as far as, you know, new things coming in that you're aware of or that projects that you're working on? Yeah, that's basically the two main things that are, that are coming down the pipes eventually. The one we already have is, which is the, which is the um, firefly fluorescence, which is, fluorescence, yeah. um, yeah. which is great. Like, um, like Dr. Tromacini said, is not only for ureters or, or for the gallbladders. Um, we'll use it for, if we're putting a colon back together, we can see, actually visualize the blood supply, um, you know, even five years ago, four or three years ago, you just have to wait and see if the tissue looks good. Say, okay, yeah, it looks good. There's some blood coming from it. We'll hook it together and, and hope it works. Um, you know, because you can't actually see the blood flowing through it now. This allows us to visualize the blood flowing through it. And if it's um, once we flip that switch, if that part of the colon isn't green, you know, lighting up green, that means blood's not getting to it. And when we put it together, it could potentially fall apart. Yeah. We want to avoid that. We want to avoid any any. Um, you know, hiccup in their recovery, Definitely. and um, and that allows us to have a safer surgery and a better recovery for these patients. Okay. So. Well, gentlemen, we're just about out of time, so I'd like to thank you guys for coming on the show and really talking about this exciting new technology. I think mm -hmm. it's really great as far as you know advancements, you know, and making things you know safer for the people, you know, and make them comfortable as well because you know technology can be quite intimidating as far as that goes. Safety is obviously our number one concern, yep. um, as well as getting people back to work and getting people feeling better faster. But the the greatest thing that is, is that it's here in Sheboygan, yeah. and that we you know we were working. I know Jeff was working through Grafton mm -hmm. and other areas that had the technology available, but just yep. to have it in our local communities yep. is, is really great. And that's yeah. one thing nice to say about Sheboygan. It's kind of a little jewel along the lakeshore of, you yeah, know, where we are quite advanced in some areas you know, that we're bringing to the field, Absolutely. Right. which is nice. Mm -hmm. So um, that concludes our show for today as far as um, robotic surgery. Um, on behalf of Dr. Witt, Dr. Drager, Dr. Tomasini uh, from Aurora Healthcare, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Thanks if you have any questions about this procedure or other show ideas, you can contact us at www.wscssheboygan.com. For quality of life in WSCS, I'm Dave Augustine. Thanks for watching.